Welcome to the Pinelander Podcast, the official podcast of Pineland, broadcasting to you from an undisclosed location deep inside Pineland, where we discuss faith, family, finances, firearms, freedom, food, and everything else in between with those who believe in living free and living out the values that made this country free. Welcome to the Pine Ladder Podcast. Uh, my ranger buddy, Mike Blackburn, is out on special assignment. And tonight, uh, we have brought a, an old guest back into the G-Base, uh, deep within Pineland. And uh, we've got a special topic uh, that we've uh, announced uh, last year, uh, which uh, Mitch Utterbach uh, was able to go out and actually uh, get, uh, uh, I would say, uh, as close as you can to all the details, actually on site to get all of the background for this awesome uh, podcast. So I hope it's awesome. I think you will like it. Uh, and so just before I get into it, let me just welcome you back, uh, thanks, Mitch. Thanks, Paul. Glad to be back. I just uh, skied up to the back door. My skis are out <laughs> back and uh, still dripping a little bit. Glad yeah. to be here. Yeah, so uh, so uh, for our listeners, uh, Mitch Utterbach is a retired lieutenant colonel. Uh, he was in the 19th group. Uh, let's see, also... 10th group, too. 10th group, yeah, that's right. right. Mm-hmm. Uh, at one point, I think you were a sergeant. Staff sergeant, 18 Bravo, 18 Echo. Right on. So uh, one of those guys that's been in our shoes. So if you're out there... Uh, and you go, well, these guys don't know what, uh, what it's like to be us. Actually, there's a lot of them out there uh, more than you would think. And Mitch is one of those guys. Uh, and Mitch is also still serving out there in the community. Appreciate that. A lot of you guys probably know him. So it's, it's wonderful to have Mitch, who is a wealth of knowledge on a lot of topics. And uh, tonight's topic is uh, something that I like uh, a lot about. That's, uh, I like to talk about a lot. It's OSS. And particularly is the uh, heavy water sabotage, uh, which we all know as uh, Telemark, uh, the uh, heavy water uh, factory at Vermark. I think I can pronounce that right. right. But is uh, one of the most successful uh, strategic level sabotages right. in World War II. That's correct. So uh, I don't want to get too down into the weeds and uh, ta- and steal the thunder of Mitch. So what I want to do is maybe let you, Mitch, just kind of go and kind of give us the big, uh, you know, broad brush strokes of wh- what are we talking about here? What what was the setting uh, in World War II and kind of sure why thing. was this even? Yeah. So the heavy water sabotage, uh, there was no American involvement. So this was not, uh, not related to OSS whatsoever. It was an operation conducted by the British Special Operations Executive formed two years before our OSS and the organization upon which the OSS was patterned. And indeed, OSS and SOE collaborated for a very, very famous uh, project called Jedburg, uh, which we've talked about before. Yeah. But back 81, 81 years ago, the Allies were afraid that Germany was leading the race or an atomic bomb. Germany had 12 Nobel Prize laureates, and that's what you're called when you win a Nobel Prize, a laureate. 12 Nobel Prize laureates available to assist them in their uh, nuclear weapons research program. Most notably, Dr. Werner Heisenberg, uh, the father of uh, quantum mechanics. He was the leading German scientist helping them uh, in their attempt to find an atomic weapon. He was the German equivalent of Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. If uh, any of you have seen the movie Oppenheimer, that's a good tutorial, albeit three hours long, uh, about that race for the atomic bomb. And there's a scene in there where Heisenberg is shown Mm -hmm. and uh, the search, their, their quest for heavy water is actually discussed. Now, if you're a real geek like I am, you may know that uh, the transporter uh, in Star Trek has a device called a Heisenberg <laughs> compensator. 
And when you <laughs> when you transport in Star Trek, uh, the Heisenberg compensator puts the atoms in your body in the exact configuration they were when you step into the <laughs> transporter room. But that's for another time. <laughs> that's awesome. Anyway, in uh, so on April 9th, nineteen forty, Germany invaded Norway by by sea and by air. One of the objectives of Operation Vesa Ubum was to take the heavy water production facility in Vemor in the Telemark district of Norway. The Germans know, knew they needed that for their atomic research program. In, in other words, to build a reactor, which back in the old, those days was called an atomic pile, mm. they decided to use deuterium oxide, which is heavy water. It's called heavy water because it's 10% heavier than normal water as a result of a neutron being added to the hydrogen atom. A hydrogen atom alone exists with just a proton and an electron. But the addition of a neutron makes it 10% heavier than normal water. And that is now called deuterium oxide when it's water. And it can be used to slow and moderate and allow for a controllable splitting of uranium atoms. Without a moderator, the reaction occur occurs too quickly, and it can't be, it can't be controlled. And that uh, that would be the first step in, in gaining uh, 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 what would what they would need to have an atomic bomb, right? That's correct. Both enriched uranium and plutonium are available through nuclear fission. So the Germans knew they they needed it. They so they took the country that had it, and they also took Norway for other reasons. And they immediately started uh, to ramp up production so that they could uh, send, it, send it back to Germany. Now, the strategic setting in the, back in 19, 1940, 41, 42, was an assessment that the Germans have to be ahead of us. Mm. They, have, they have the best scientists. They now control the only place in the world that produces heavy water. Mm. And we thought that they were in the lead. And eventually, the Allies put together uh, a few operations to disable that that research. Yeah, so uh, and I know as you're going to explain, uh, the successful mission uh, was, um, I mean, there were quite a few uh, attempts. I mean, it was something like two years, yeah. something like that. I mean, even from the beginning of, uh, I mean, the Allies had, the SOE had probably considered this, uh, as the Germans were invading, they 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 already knew that that uh, heavy water plant and the yeah. the potential of that. Yeah, let's uh, talk about uh, why why in Vemork, Norway was there uh, heavy water. So Norway uh, has a, an abundance of mountains and water, and the ability to make hydroelectric power. Mm. The hydroelectric plant that was built on the cliff above the Mona River Gorge in the early 1900s was at the time the world's largest hydroelectric plant. They had more electricity than they needed, actually. So they were able to start producing nitrate fertilizer um, by, uh, through a process, taking part of it out of the air. Um, and with the discovery of heavy water in the early 1930s, Norway knew that hey, this is a this is a substance that researchers are going to want, and we can we can have a fact modify our factory and we can produce this product and we can sell it. So, in the thirties, uh, one of their scientists named Leif Tronstad, he designed the heavy water facility there in Vemork, and they had a guy named Jomar Brun who was the plant manager at a building there that manufactured hydrogen for commercial purposes. So they, they saw that uh, this new substance had been discovered by an American, American Harold Ure, and they said, hey, people are good, scientists are going to need this. We can, use, we can make it. Let's uh, modify some of our equipment, and let's start uh, making heavy water. And it's done through a process of uh, electrolysis and distillation. All you need is water and electricity, and they had more than they needed. Yeah. So that's that's why they built it there. And then uh, 
atomic research scientist to realize, hey, that's probably going to be a good moderator, we realize. So it was, it was an interesting case of Norwegians coming, uh, having the ability to make it, knowing that there's probably going to be a research market for it also. And it's, un, it's interesting that they, they created a need for something that also contributed to the reasons why they got invaded. Uh, but there are, there were other reasons, but that was certainly one of the lines of effort of Operation Vesa Ubung was hey, get get to Vimork and control that plant. Hmm. So that's, uh, that's and then with the, the SOE, uh, the Special Operations Executive, uh, as you discussed earlier, uh, I mean they had their eye on that, and as well as other uh, targets yeah. within Norway. Yes, yes, uh, the uh, uh, SOE. Uh, had the had the good fortune to have access to Norwegians that had fled Norway after the invasion. Uh, they Norway, like I said, was invaded on April 9th, nineteen forty. Their army was closer to a World War One style army, uh, being invaded by an army that was ten, arguably ten years ahead of any other at the time. And they fought for two months. They fought for two months with their Craig Jorgensen rifles and their wool uniforms. They were certainly better winter warriors than the Germans, but they were simply overwhelmed. But for two months, they fought a delaying action. They uh, fought hard enough at the beginning to allow their king and the royal family to escape to Sweden. They fought hard enough to allow their cabinet and their parliament to get out and their national gold reserve reserves were moved out too. But they eventually capitulated after, yeah. after two months. And Norway was occupied by Nazi Germany longer than any other country mm. of World War II. From 9, 9 April 1940 until May 8, 1945, when Germany unconditionally surrendered, Norway had over 300,000 German troops there the whole time. That's yeah. I, I learned about that. Uh, I can't remember the documentary I was watching, but yeah, there's a lot of the, they tied up uh, another outside of the discussion here. But uh, these uh, the sabotage uh, operations that were going on actually, you know, probably led to uh, consi that considerable amount of Germans that were left there that weren't at you know France or somewhere else to, to face uh, the Allies. So it's a lot of interesting uh, connections between these sabotage operations that are going on and, and Norway. So it's very important for not just this reason, but uh, lots of them. It's amazing. Well, have me back sometime, and we'll talk about the OSS sabotage mission in Norway, the OSS railroad sabotage mission in Norway wow. in early 1945 designed to slow down troop movements from Norway to Western Europe. Operation wow. Ripa, Ripa was the only American parachute and ski operation conducted in World War II. It was led by uh, American Jedberg by the name of William Colby, Major William yeah. Colby, who went wow. on to be the director yeah. of the CIA. Wow. in the early 1970s. So we'll talk about that in a, f in yeah. a future interview. Uh, yeah, you, you promised. So we're going to have, you have to deliver at some point. <laughs> Happy to do it. <laughs> awesome. Well, I had, uh, so, the, I mean, that's that's the big broad brush strokes. Yeah. And, and that's the importance of why uh, uh, that actually had to be taken out. But let me just ask you this. Uh, why sabotage? Why not bombing? You know, why not some other form of attack? The heavy water production facility, 18 cylinders, about four and a half to five feet tall, 12 inch diameter steel cylinders, were located in the hydrogen building at the Norsk Hydro Power Plant in Vimork. The, the heavy water distillation room was in the basement of a seven story steel reinforced concrete building built on the edge of a cliff. Okay. There, there was, uh, the Germans in their hubris, th 
thought that this is, no one can get here. Um, and by the way, the, the uh, 200 meter deep gorge, uh, which wow. the people of Rukan, the nearby town, um, always told their kids, don't go down in the gorge, don't climb down there, it's too steep, it's too deep, it's too dangerous. The Germans thought that it was impassable. Yeah. The only route into the Norsk Hydro plant was over a suspension bridge or up the railroad tracks from the town of Rukan, several miles away. So It just seemed impregnable. Impregnable indeed. Uh, and uh, combined with uh, something that the Nazis were good at, uh, hubris, uh, Thinking that uh, it cu- it couldn't be it, we can't we don't think we could do it therefore anybody yeah. no one else can do it absolutely so the uh, was it an undoing indeed it was so there there are uh, the the when it was decided in 1942 that the plant and the the means of heavy water production and the heavy water have to be destroyed to slow down the German atomic research program, it was decided by SOE that they were going to use airborne com- commandos, uh, British airborne commandos that were going to arrive by towed glider, by the Horsa gliders that uh, many people are familiar with. Uh, the, sa- the same Horsa gliders that uh, at Pegasus Bridge. So yeah, think Pegasus, Pegasus Bridge. Bridge. And those were the Horsa gliders, towed by four-engine Halifax bombers. So the plan, uh, interestingly, uh, combined operations, which was the British headquarters for commando operations, they um, they said that we could do this with one glider. 17, 17 commandos can get this job done. And there's been a couple of times in uh, World War II when the initial assessment was we can get it done with this amount, but leaders at combined operations, I don't know if it was Lord Mountbatten himself, said, no, let's double the numbers. And the gliders had been, uh, uh, I mean, of course, outside of the scope of this, but the, the Germans already used gliders in, in uh, Holland. Um, uh, my brain's not working, uh, but the, the fortress there. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, uh, uh, plenty other play. I mean, so gliders were a known commodity. Oh yeah, all both sides had gliders. Eben Amel, there you go. The 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 fort there, yes. So uh, Germans had gliders. The British had gliders. We have uh, the Waco glider. There's yeah. a there's a certain road you can drive to here to come to a three way intersection, and there's a Waco glider staring mm-hmm. at you in the face. So the the British decided we're going to uh, we're going to send two two gliders to uh, a, a landing strip to be determined somewhere near the plant. And uh, we are going to have an advanced party of four Norwegians set up the landing zone, and they will guide the uh, combat engineers, actually, the combat engineer commandos to the plant. They will fight their way across the bridge get into the plant, destroy the heavy water and the means of production, break into small groups of three to four men, and they will escape and evade over 200 miles to neutral Sweden. Now, the the exfil plan was not that well thought out. They were taught some very rudimentary Norwegian. They were not ski trained. but they told the commandos, you know, the risks involved, and they, were, they had more volunteers than they needed. That's how important things were. So. Uh, the advance party, those were, like you said before, uh, we've had, uh, you know, a good uh, amount of Norwegians that were able to escape. Yeah. Uh, they're trained up. Uh, I believe some of them were given some, uh, you know, maybe two or three jumps. And, uh, okay, now you're qualified. Yeah. And it wasn't the advance party to be jump, jumped in, mm-hmm. and then uh, they trekked uh, uh, Nordic uh, skied yeah. uh, to to this said location. That was yeah. the whole part of the plan. Yeah, let me mention the, uh, the very first guy that's uh, considered one of the major contributors to the mission. His name was Einar Schinnerland. He uh, 
he worked in at the dam. He was an engineer at the dam in the near near the plant. And he was one of a handful of Norwegians that hijacked a uh, coastal steamer and shail- sailed it to the Shetland Islands so that they could get to Scotland and get to the UK. Once he arrived in London and was debriefed, uh, by the way, he had told his employer at the dam, I'm just going on a, taking two weeks vacation, I'm going on a ski trip. He p- helped hijack the ship. They got to the Shetland Islands. He got to London. SOE is debriefing him. And they realize that you you have access to the heavy water. You have access to the Norse hydro plant. You worked wow. there as a technician. Your family works on the dam nearby. Uh, would you be willing to return and help us with a very important mission? And he said yes. He's gold mine. Yeah, wow. They put him through a very quick shake and bake parachute course. And by the yeah. way, they said, yeah, you'll be returning by parachute. And we mean shake and bake. Yeah. <laughs> like like he two was days already, and one day, three jumps. He already like knew that. Morse code. He was already a, a maritime oh. radio operator. So they, they taught him how to quickly, how to become a SOE radio operator, taught him how to parachute, told him a few things about uh, espionage. And less than two weeks after he had arrived in the UK, they parachuted him back. Jumped him back in, and he became uh, a courier, a spy, and a radio operator. So he was their first uh, uh, planted source at at the at the plant, and he had access and placement to all the right people there. And he immediately began sending back information about the speed at which the Germans were ramping up heavy water production, and it, his reports really put a sense of urgency into yeah. the Allies and. It was decided, uh, after in part after Schinnerlan's intel, that we need to get the airborne troops in there to, to blow the thing up. And you had, uh, I think earlier we had a conversation about uh, our own efforts uh, towards an atomic bomb uh, and uh, how we uh, have, uh, there's a few scenes in the movie Oppenheimer kind of making a, it's a good plug for the movie. Yeah. It's a good movie. Yeah. But uh, you, you mentioned that this mm-hmm. is this is a good point. We're 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 actually a good ways into it, I think, or maybe you know maybe not as far as a, uh, we maybe thought the Germans were a little farther. But what happened is they uh, uh, they took a the wrong turn. Yep, there's a scene in the movie where the American scientists uh, finally find out that Heisenberg and his scientists have decided to use deuterium oxide, heavy water as the moderator for their atomic pile. And the American scientists slap themselves on the knee and they say, they made a wrong turn, we got them. They've used yeah. heavy water. Mm. The United States was using solid, pure graphite blocks as our moderator. And Dr. Enrico Fermi at the University of Chicago um, built a reactor, an atomic pile, uh, using blocks of graphite and uh, uranium. So that's how we got our, our pile to go critical, and that's how it was moderated. The Germans decided not to use graphite. It was unreliable to them, but their problem was they couldn't refine it pure enough. So had they found a pure form of graphite to use and had Heisenberg chose that, it could have been quite a different story. Yeah, but uh, and you, it, absolutely. But at the time, we're thinking... But let's not give them a chance right. to fix their problem. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and, and that might be a, a dramatized part of the movie, but in 42, yeah. in, on March 28th, 1942, when Einar Schinnerland parachuted uh, back onto the Hardanger Plateau near Vemork, uh, we didn't know which one was going to work better. Exactly. So Schinnerland jumps in, he starts sending back intel, and then by October... The advance party, the four-man Norwegian SOE-trained advanced party, is parachuted in on the night of October 18th, 1942, and that's called Operation Grouse. Grouse. Operation Grouse is uh, young men uh, from several, a few of them from the local area, highly trained, and their initial job are airborne pathfinders. They parachute in, they establish radio contact, they 
select a location for the gliders to land, and they wait. They hide on in one of the small mountain huts up there on the Hardanger Plateau, which is Europe's largest mountain plateau. And the weather conditions, as a result of the North Sea, make it as close to polar weather as you can oh. get not being at the poles. And polar explorers throughout history have trained on the Hardanger Vita, the Hardanger Plateau. Um, anybody who's stood on the North or South Pole uh, quite likely practiced mm. in this part of Norway. Yeah, the, uh, the, I saw a documentary about that, uh, heroes of, uh, the r- true heroes of the real heroes of, of Telemark. Yep. I think the Ray Mears BBC program, probably. Yeah, and just the track that these guys made, uh, the hundreds of kilometers or, or however far it was, but the, uh, and the, uh, their kit and their packs... Uh, went over lakes. Yes. I mean, just uh, frozen feet uh, and then getting somewhere for the night and uh, thawing themselves out. Yeah, not, I mean, quite a selection event. Well, I tell you, the um, having, having young men that uh, lost their country to an invader, having young men that were outdoorsmen already, who by the age of two, you know, knew how to cross country ski, mm-hmm. having young men that uh, grew up looking at that factory on the edge of the cliff. They were, the SOE was and the world was quite fortunate that these young men had earlier fought the Germans, got out of Norway, and found their way back to to London to be wow. recruited for the Norwegian Independent Company Number no. One, and then handpicked to go back in. Now, by the time these guys jumped in, Professor Leif Tronstad had uh, gotten out of Norway and had gotten to England and was uh, really the, the technical mastermind behind the plan to get in there and to sabotage the heavy water. He was one of the, the scientists who had helped design it. Wow. They also had access to Jomar Brun. He was the hydrogen building plant manager. He was passing intel uh, from the inside to Schinnerland, who was sending it out by courier or by Morse code, uh, HF, uh, just like any uh, 18 Echo. Uh, there were there's been there's been people 80 years ago that had strategic level information that that, that they had to get their antenna up and they had to get the message out. Uh, but eventually, Brun, uh, by the time Operation Grouse jumped in, he had gotten out too. Mm. But. Uh, there was, there was some small-scale sabotage happening by the addition of castor oil into the, the heavy water, which caused it to foam badly, and it ruined it. Mm-hmm. But uh, the Germans were still able to keep making more and more. That's the reason why the, the glider operation, codenamed Freshman Operation Freshman, mm-hmm. was ready to go in. So Grouse jumps in on October 18th. They have their comm set up. They're waiting for the right weather and the right amount of lunar illumination. Back in those days, um, ops were best conducted during a full moon so that the illumination on the snow and on the land was uh, better able to be perceived by the navigator on board. Mm. So finally, uh, by uh, November, period of darkness, November 19... 1942, the the gliders launch from northern Scotland. Unfortunately, yeah. this was the longest glider tow operation attempted of World War II. Unfortunately, the transceiver, the transmitter that the Operation Grouse guys had on the ground, the Eureka system, was pinging up to the Rebecca system on the bombers, but the receiver on the bomber wasn't working. So they had a homing beacon system to follow, but the receiver on the bomber was not not picking it up. The, the, The four Norwegians of Grouse were in the right place. Unfortunately, the... One of the bombers towing the glider crashed into a mountain. 
one of the bombers towing a glider had to, the rope broke, the tow rope broke, and that bomber returned safely back to the UK, but that glider crashed. The few commandos that survived the crash in both both gliders were captured by the Germans within 24 hours, interrogated, and executed because it was just the month before that Hitler had issued his commando befehl, which said, uh, doesn't matter if you're in uniform, if you're a parachutist or a commando, Mm -hmm. uh, here to do sabotage, you are to be quickly which we, you know, we would say now tactically questions for, for whatever we could get out of you and execute it right away. A clear violation of the law of armed conflict. Yeah. So sadly, all 34 of the, of the airborne commandos and the gliders were killed in the crash or executed by the Germans. And the crew of one of the Halifax bombers, the t- one of the tow bombers that crashed into the mountain. Total casualties, Operation Freshman, 41 killed. Operation Grouse is informed that the mission failed. They are required to now survive until a follow-on mission is put together. Operation Grouse, renamed Operation Swallow, is told, hold in place, stand by. They nearly starve to death. Their food is gone. There's very little to eat. From October 18th, 1942, when they jumped in, until December 23rd, they subsisted on whatever they could find, sometimes eating lichen or reindeer moss recovered from under the sto- snow. But finally, the, on December 23rd, they shoot their first reindeer, mm. and they know they're going to survive. Mm. They wait. They wait until February, when the new mission, Operation Gunnerside, is, is put together. Six special operations trained Norwegians are parachuted in on February 18th. These are the guys that are going to blow the plant. And that's a, that is a, that's, this is the part where it, it might be helpful to tell, tell the rest of the story using a, a well-known acronym that uh, any, any engineer, any combat engineer knows about. So, do you want to uh, yeah, get me the, through those, Paul? Yeah. Uh, so I remember as a uh, young 18 Charlie, and uh, I was introduced to the Carver Matrix. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, 18 Charlies, they were like, hey, I know this. Well, at you least you need to know that, but also it, to know that it's a tool. It was a tool developed by the OSS. And I would imagine the SOE, probably in uh, uh, collaboration, somewhere that somewhere the magic happened. But uh, it is a, it is a uh, a metric device uh, that's used for uh, sabotage, and uh, so yeah, uh, no doubt uh, when they looked at this, uh, you know, they they went through that metric. So yeah, the Carver. Uh, I think mm-hmm. first we're looking at uh, the criticality. You know, how critical is this? Uh, it could go from a component yep. part to the actual, you know, operating system. As, as a whole, uh, obviously, I mean, you already walked us through how yeah. important this thing is. Yeah, how much how much bigger can the capital C be on criticality yeah. when it comes to <laughs> let's slow down the Nazis' progress on an atomic bomb? Yeah, I think, because yeah. the 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 first one would definitely be they assessed it would be used on London. Yeah, so that's uh, that's pretty critical. That's up there. And the, the room is fairly small. There's only 18 heavy water cylinders in the basement of this seven-story factory. So it's, uh, they, they, knew the, they knew where the components were, and uh, we've talked already about how critical it was. So criticality with the biggest capital C you could imagine. Absolutely. Uh, not as uh, uh, a little bit of a difficulty here with the accessibility. There's your A. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have, you mentioned a uh, 200 meter, uh, gorge, uh, you've got surrounded by mountains. Uh, you've got, uh, I mean, uh, some of the most inhospitable terrain in the winter, yep. uh, difficult. Well, the Germans thought it was inaccessible. So the yeah. Germans, if they looking at their reverse carver, they would have said, uh, 
inaccessible. So accessibility not a, not applicable here. Yeah. So when it's uh, but but these were <laughs> these were specially trained men from yeah. the local area, and a few of them would have uh, were Olympic caliber athletes. Yeah. So as the uh, so you've got your access and placement. You've got people from the area. So you've got uh, all that great intel that's being pumped out of there. I well, mean, well I tell painting you, painting the picture. Once Operation Gunnerside parachuted in this, those six men, and they linked up with Operation Swallow, there were eleven guys ready to go. Two of them were left up on the Hardanger Plateau. Einar Schinnerland and Knut Haugland were left up on the plateau as radio operators, retrans, literally, to send mission results back to London, good or bad. So nine men went to a, a mission support site in a cabin, and Klaus Helberg skied, one of, the, one of the saboteurs, skied from their MSS down to Rukon, took off his skis, climbed down the gorge in daylight, crossed the Mona River, climbed up the gorge, and got to the railroad tracks that led up to the plant. Literally a one-man recon. Wow. Then he returned back to his team that same day and told them uh, that we can do this. Wow. We've got, we got 200 meters down. We cross a frozen river. There's 200 meters up. I found a place. Where, Cakewalk. Yeah. Where, where trees grow, they said, where trees grow, a man can climb. And they, they found a place. Uh, but the Germans thinking that gorge is inaccessible. We have, a, we have a guard post and a machine gun nest right at the end of the, of the suspension bridge. The mountain behind us is ringed with minefields. There's, this, there's no way guys can get in here. Plus, we've got a 15-man guard shack right outside the hydrogen building itself. And the door is locked. There's no way. It's got a um, Monte La Defensa type of feel to it. No one would go up this sheer cliff. You know, this place is impregnable. Yeah, and all of the, you know, the hubris of the master race, you know. <laughs> uh, Carthaginian, the Carthaginian general Hannibal gave us a good, great motivator when a, he coined the phrase that it's at least attributed to him when it came to crossing the Alps. We must either find a way or make one. Uh, and. Nice. Uh, that's a good one to. That's what a good one to keep in in, uh, in your head and your heart when you got to do something. No hard. doubt, especially that was in that guy's uh, heart and head who was doing that one man recce. Yeah, uh, and probably didn't break a sweat. I mean, these guys, you know. Plus, this was their this is their home their homeland. Yep, he was a local and he was an outstanding skier. And uh, that wasn't the only time he skied. He skied mm -hmm. and did something incredibly important. But Helberg, he did the one man recce. You know, and he did it in civvies, and he, nobody saw him. And he wow. got, got back to the cabin that was the MSS, and uh, he, he briefed the leader of the op, uh, who was uh, Joachim Ronneberg, and they said, okay, we can do this. Mm. So that, uh, that's how the, the uh, heavy water saboteurs, also known as the heroes of Telemark, that's how they turned the inaccessible into the accessible of the Carver Matrix. No doubt. And then, uh, so criticality, accessibility, recuperability. Uh, yeah, a little little more, um, put some more brain power into this one. I, I don't think I usually uh, went that deep when I first heard this. But uh, recuperability, obviously, uh, you think of a train, you know, derailment, a bridge. Uh, this is pretty easy. So, uh, you know, the intent, the commander's intent is to take said bridge out for how long, you know. So you could, this would be an easy way to understand that. Um, and so it's in, in terms of recuperability for uh, Telemark, Vermark, the heavy water plant, uh, I, I would imagine their idea was just, hey, let's just uh, demolish uh, every aspect that could actually produce the heavy water, not necessarily the entire factory. Mm -hmm. But uh, recuperability, I guess they would want to be, that would be pretty high. They wouldn't want that would not be able to be recouped. So how, however, you know, that would be like one of the big metrics. And this that, would, would get a, that would get a, what, a six or whatever. This, would all, this was also probably one of the biggest unknowns. Yeah. Um, being the 
or Pfizer. High, high on the hubris scale, but also high on the technology and indus- industry scale. This um, One of the downers of this mission was within a couple of months, the Germans had repaired the room, wow. uh, replaced all 18 cylinders that had been blown, and were back in back in production. You know, the Germans always, you see those movies in World War II, of the World War II era, uh, you know, it gets bombed to smithereens, and then they're out repairing the cobblestone streets. Right. I mean, those Germans are just industrious. And they had you plenty know. of slave labor, too. <laughs> they did. And they had, <laughs> but they had good scientists. So recoup- this was wow. much more recuperable than the Allies had assessed. And that's yeah. one of the unknowns. You, you didn't know how quickly the Germans could do it, and they had they had already had the plans. They had already reverse engineered the cylinders. Wow. They um, they had the Norwegians cranking out new cylinders fairly quickly, yeah. and uh, that unfortunately was recovered re- uh, faster than than the Allies thought it would. Yeah, and then the uh, the other aspect of this is uh, uh, the vulnerability of it. Uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier. As far as hey, why not just drop a bomb? Mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned this was uh, you know in the basement of a seven floor, seven floored uh, factory, and so you got lots of concrete. You've yep. got rebar. Uh, I don't think they had a bomb back then that could do that. No, and no. so yeah, you got to get you got to get some some operators in there. Yeah, it was. Uh, let's add let's add a I N to the word, and it was invulnerable. Yeah. with regard to the Germans and even when uh, they went you know when the saboteurs got into the room the night watchman was just flabbergasted mm. that there were people in here uh, the one the only person that saw them in the com in there was uh, two Norwegians you know a watchman and a Norwegian security guard but the I like the the Richard Harris movie, uh, made in the '60s, where there's just shooting everywhere because they gotta they gotta sex it up. Yeah. It's Hollywood, but uh, yeah, yeah. Well, give me time at the end, and I'll yeah, and yeah. I'll make some recommendations <laughs> for some uh, Norwegian war movies that that, that people can nice. can check out. But um, the, it was you know it was perceived as invulnerable being in the basement of that seven story steel reinforced concrete building, and hev- heavily guarded. Um, uh, but interestingly, it these metal cylinders only needed uh, just over a nine-pound charge on mm. each of them to destroy them uh, using a plastic explosive called Nobel 808. Mm. And you know Nobel got the Nobel Prize for coming up with explosives? Exactly. You know what's wild about that, too? It just shows uh, uh, the... Um, the broad understanding of vulnerability. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, uh, uh, I mean, you're, you're looking at this critical component part of this, and then they're sort of attacking that. So you're, you're, you're looking at, some people just think, hey, you can, it has to be explosive. It could also be, you know, a, a wrench placed <laughs> in the wrong place, sure. uh, a bolt, you know, looks yeah. like an accident. Uh, yeah. and, and so it's not only just the, the uh, the factory as a whole, but the, you know those critical component parts. Yeah, and I misspoke. Nobel Nobel didn't get his own prize, but the prize, the Nobel yeah, yeah, Prize, yeah. is named after the scientist, um, a major you know inventor of explosives. But you know the access the accessibility was seemingly impossible. But if we think in terms of how easy it was to damage this mm-hmm. facility, less than a ten pound charge on yeah. each one of these things, and uh, you know, it ripped them. It ripped them open. Yeah, and then the effect. Uh, there's our E. Uh, obviously, uh, the effect to the German war machine, the, to the their ability to create an atomic bomb. Uh, this would you know, you know ser- severely degrade that ability. This was it. This was like all their their chips mm-hmm. are one are on red seven right here. So if you knock that out, I mean that was it. And they had some. I think you said uh, well, you, you may mention that earlier. There's some, maybe some other heavy water that had been attempted to be, you know, brought out. But for all intents and purposes, this was it. Yes, this definitely. The effect was to. It was there were several effects. It slowed it slowed down. It it completely destroyed the room 
where, yeah. where the heavy water was being produced. So it stopped it for a period of time. Now, Heisenberg did, did have a certain amount of heavy water already in Germany, but he needed more. He didn't have enough to, to make his atomic pile go critical. Uh, but the, the effect was stopped the production for a short while, but it also uh, it showed, once again, uh, the Germans how valuable this stuff is. And uh, probably, well, let me jump back. So when Operation Freshman uh, happened, not all the maps were destroyed. Mm-hmm. They, the Germans found a map uh, in, in the wreckage that had, it was the map sheet for Rukon, and then it had the heavy water plants circled. So they knew that was the target in November of 1942, so they wow. increased security at the plant in Vemork, which I believe uh, helped the Germans assess that this is even more inaccessible because we knew the Brits, the, the Englanders were going to try to attack mm-hmm. this, so now we've strengthened our guards there, our defenses, so more impregnable. Uh, the effect, though back to E, of the Operation Gunner side being successful, you know, four guys got into that heavy water room and placed charges and blew everyone up as they had practiced mm. using uh, plastic explosives, um, non-electric uh, uh, detonators. Got out, they, they blew it up, they got out, they got away, they got across the gorge before the Germans really n- knew what had happened. Anyway, the effect on the Germans was, we've got to move this production out of Norway. We are going to move it to Germany. And that is something um, Heiner Schinnerland sent back, first of all, the report that they've, they are back up, they're producing again. Uh, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. So they, that... Gunner side raid did not cause them to decide to move it to Germany. Let me mm. let me uh, talk about an air raid in a few minutes. Yeah, but the effect was to slow it down for a while. Yeah, and they actually started making more than they ever had before. So yeah. it slowed it down for several weeks, but when they got it back up and running, they were making more than ever. Yeah, it's a race. I mm-hmm. mean, this is. Uh, uh, going into 43, I mean, you already had, we already had the Manhattan Project up and running. And so there's a, there's a race to, to get this, uh, you know, uh, formidable weapon that, that could level cities. Yep. And, uh, and then the, uh, the last uh, part of Carver, of course, is the recognizability. And then obviously um, the factory is, that's, it's not. Just, it's beyond that, though. It's the the critical component. I believe is what we're looking at. Is uh, how, how am I understanding that correctly? How how easy would it be to find it and uh, locate it in a in a, in a rapid level? Or I mean, maybe I've un- misunderstood this part of Carver I, all the time. I think this. I think you're right. This is this is where the Norwegians they won. They were winning from the beginning. Yeah. The man, the scientist Leif Tromstad, who helped design the heavy water production facility was already back in London. Mm. Jomar Brun, the plant manager for the hydrogen building, uh, he brought the blueprints out with him, was already back in London. Mm. Boys from the local area were already trained by the SOE, had already parachuted onto the Hardanger Vita, having practiced on full-scale mock-ups over a hundred times back in the UK. They, they knew everything. So this, this was the kind of mission that they would fall asleep and they could see themselves doing it. It was uh, highly recognizable. So these guys, uh, uh, you've got the Norwegians. Uh, they do grouse. Uh, they've got this long trek. They almost starved to death. Uh, you have, um, I forgot the, the name of the operation where the uh, the glider goes down, unfortunately. Operation Freshman. Freshman goes down. And then, but finally, uh, Grouse has set up uh, the landing zone, mm-hmm. the drop zone, uh, for Gunnerside. 
The other side team comes in. <coughs> Excuse me. We got the uh, grouse. Uh, gunner side jump drops blind. Mm. It takes them several days to link up with newly named, newly renamed Swallow. Swallow, that's right. Swallow. So, so Swallow and Gunner side link up within a few days after Gunner side drops in. Oh, I forgot and, that part. Yeah. And they're able to uh, do the recon on uh, daytime on the twenty seventh. Make move, make movement after dark. Twenty seventh February, nineteen forty three. Gotcha. Yeah. And then, so this is, so the night of the raid is the period of darkness, 27, 28. 28. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And then, so we're talking like how many hours uh, of uh, those guys making entry, placing charges, setting them and do their, you know, fire and hole sequence. I mean, what, what are we looking at here? Time on target. From cutting the gate to get into the compound after climbing up the gorge, following the railroad tracks. Cut the gate at 12.30. They were back down in the gorge, exfilling by uh, 0145. Wow, okay, so, so a lot. little over an hour. Okay. Uh, with four guys making entry to the building, five of them on security, covering different aspects of the guard force. But not a shot fired. Not a shot fired because... They, uh, I mean, that would have been the jig would have been up. I mean, they've got uh, the Germans had a lot of firepower, as you said, they reinforced it. And unlike the movie I mentioned earlier, I forgot the name of it with Heroes uh, of Telemark. That's right, Kurt with Douglas, uh, Kurt Douglas, uh, Richard Harris, Nin uh, 1965 movie. Yeah, and of course, there's just you know lots of uh, just spraying and praying, but uh, not happening. I mean, these guys snuck in clandestine. Uh, getting the deed done and getting out. Yeah, it so, was a it was a cold night. You know, February, late February in Norway. It's uh, with for us, for us Fahrenheit folks. It's it's in the minus teens. It's in the minus twenties. Wow. The Germans uh, think they're in some important, but you know, it's kind of cush duty. We've just got to guard this plant. You know, we're here in a country. They don't really like us, but these are our Nordic brothers and sisters. And the guards, um, the guard shift changed at 12.30. Correction, guards changed at midnight. They gave them 30 minutes to start freezing and, you know, nice. bu bundle up. They, so they, had, they had the uh, pattern of life. Everything. They, okay. knew, they knew from Brunn uh, what the guard, guard rotation was. And uh, they waited. And they moved movement by stealth using weather to their advantage and human nice. disc. The human uh, desire to not be uncomfortable. Mm. Uh, the Germans stayed in. Uh, when when the charges went off, they were so deep in the building, there was just sort of a thump and a rumble. But all the windows were blacked out in the building. Not a window broke. And uh, this hydrogen building itself would sometimes uh, outgas hydrogen with kind of a, a boom. So the Germans were also desensitized to thumping noises coming from the building or maybe some kind of wildlife setting off a landmine up on the mountainside. Mm. So you know how people want to want to say that's not really the worst case scenario. I can think of a couple of other things that it probably was. And that's what the Germans did. One guy poked his head out after the thump, but he, then he went back inside. Wow. The command, the the saboteurs laid low, let them get back in, but they had drawn down on them. They were ready to, they were ready to kill them all. They, they might not have gotten away themselves, but charges charges go off. Mm -hmm. They get they all get out through the gate that they had cut. A lot of discipline. They uh, they even used challenge and password that uh, they laughed at later. That like, why are we even using this? You know, we know that it's just us. One guy said, well, that's what we trained in. <laughs> you know, I think it was uh, Leicester Square and Piccadilly Circus was the challenge and password. And he said, it's, uh, of course it's me. Yeah. Who else would be out here in the middle of the night? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> doing this? Who it's, else is dressed in a British yeah. wool uniform wow. running away from the hydro building? It's Of course it's me. So they, so, uh, uh, you know, you, you discussed that they were able to repair but uh, so yeah, 
the thud happens. They destroy uh, the canisters. Uh, and, and this is the tactical aspect. I have no idea what these, you know, uh, tubes, how they're working and all that. But they're doing their thing. And, mm -hmm. of course, uh, they're destroyed. They have destroyed those. Yep. Uh, they make their exfil. And then uh, there was something I think you were going to go into earlier is uh, uh, there was a shipment of oh, yeah. some more heavy water. Yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll uh, maybe you could just just tease it. Sure thing. There's <laughs> a once once uh, so the the saboteurs get away. Yeah, they get up on the Hardanger Plateau. A storm covers. A uh, storm uh, locks them down for a few days on a cabin out in the middle of nowhere. But it also keeps three thousand Germans from chasing after them. Wow. Uh, the The short story of the of the egress of the saboteurs is uh, all nine get away. All nine survive the war. Actually, the 11 uh, total survive the war. Uh, the five, gun five of the six gunner side guys are ordered to ski to neutral Sweden. Over 300 miles in 18 days, they ski to neutral Sweden, which is great having a safe haven, a neutral safe haven country right on your border, really helped facilitate Norwegian resistance activities during World War II. So five gunner side guys ski to Sweden. Uh, the other guys uh, eventually make it back to London, not without some high adventure. Yeah. But two of them, uh, Knut Hauklid, who jumped in with gunner side and Einar Schinnerland, who's been there since March 28, 1942, they stay there for the entire war and conduct other resistance activities. One of them we're going to talk about in a second. So by, by mid-November 1943, uh, General Groves, played by Matt Damon in uh, Oppenheimer, mm -hmm. says, uh, hey, we got to bomb that thing. You know, they're back up to production. You know, Groves was the uh, military leader of the Manhattan Project. So he says, we're going to bomb that thing. I don't, uh, I don't care what civilian casualties might be. You know, we got to do it. So Ira Eaker, 8th Air Force, they, they launch a, a, a big bombing raid on the factory in mid-November 43. A few bombs hit the hydrogen building, but none, the heavy water production facility is undamaged. Over 20 Norwegian civilians are killed in the bombing raid. <clears throat> and the factory, the the... Several pilots mistake the fertilizer factory in Rukon several miles away as the heavy water plant, and they bomb it also. Yeah. So they really hurt the local economy and, re and uh, release some noxious substances into the air. But the effect yeah. of the bombing raid causes the Germans to decide, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to move all this to Germany. We're, enough of this. So the November, mid-November 43 bombing losses. raid yeah. says, let's move this all to Germany. Mm. So Intel gets back to London th that the Germans are going to move it, and they're going to move it by ferry boat. Excuse mm. me. <coughs> they're going to move it by ferry. Knut Haukelid is still, still there. He receives, he sends information <clears throat> to London. The Germans are going to move all the heavy water by rail down, by rail from the factory to a ferry boat on a lake at the end of the rail line. Then they're going to get it eventually out to the North Sea and they're going to ship it to Germany. London comes back with Norwegian government permission. You got to stop it. Tell us the best way to do it. He conducts an assessment and says, I think the most vulnerable this, this shipment's going to be all 4,000 pounds of heavy water is going to be on this ferry, the Hydro Ferry on Lake Tin. So he's given permission, sink the ferry. Mm. And he recruits a couple of other guys. And on... The morning of February 20th, 1944, 
he he and another guy have already he and Richard Harris as in the movie. Yeah. Well, the uh, night before night of the nineteenth, nineteenth February forty four. They sneak on board the ferry. Now, the railroad line is heavily guarded. The factory is heavily guarded. But the ferry boat that they're going to put the heavy water on, the Germans aren't guarding it. Mm. Hauklid and another guy sneak onto the boat. 19 pounds of plastic explosive. Put in the bow. uh, Sort of in a, a donut charge. With time delay of two alarm clocks double primed with two alarm clocks that a local clockmaker helped them with. They are compromised by a member of the crew while they're doing their work. But they tell him, hey, we're with the resistance. We're just, we got to hide some stuff on the boat. He buys the story because he's a loyal Norwegian. And they set the, the clocks to go off at about 1030 the next day when it's going to be over the deepest part of the lake. German, German soldiers put the heavy water on. Wow. Norwegian civilians who were taking the ferry board it. And the charge goes off as planned. The hydro ferry sinks to the bottom of the lake, a thousand feet down. Norwegian civilian lives are lost, but all of the heavy water is sent to the bottom of the lake. Only four barrels rise to the surface. They were partially filled, but with a very low concentration of heavy water. And as a result of the 20 February 1944 sinking of the Hydro, the German atomic research program is effectively ended. Mm. But by that time, we are well, well, well ahead of them. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, uh, by that time, we, uh, you know, we were another uh, maybe a year. A year away, something like that. Yeah, we uh, we're about a year we're a year away from um, the uh, Trinity Trinity yeah, test. Trinity, yeah, out in New Mexico. But yeah, they're like a two staged, uh, yeah, and th- that another operation all on its own, but uh, but attached and uh, coordinated by one of the same guys who were actually were on the hit, uh, and uh, Vermore. Yep. So yeah, Knut Hauklid was. Uh, he was a Nazi atomic weapons program stopping Muldoon uh, the whole time, you know. And and he, you know, he stayed and he conducted other resistance activities. You know, he wow. he and Schinnerland uh, built a hut up there on the Hardanger Plateau, and they just stayed and toughed it out and took the fight to the enemy. Wow. You know, the whole time that uh, Germany was in in their country. And every one of these saboteurs are national heroes. Mm-hmm. They, the, the saboteurs, the 11 men who conducted the, uh, the initial attack, they are remembered in Norway better than the 12 Americans who have walked on the moon are remembered in our country. Wow. Now, yes, 12 Americans, listeners, have walked on the moon. It just wasn't two guys. But uh, so th- uh, all Norwegians are taught about the saboteurs. It's part of their national heritage and their history. And their, their mission uh, was conducted. The heavy water sabotage was conducted. It'll be 81 years. Well, it has been 81 years just uh, last month at the end of February, a couple of days ago. And you went there yourself. And you retraced this, all yep. this whole mission. You were on the very ground. Certainly was. There is there is a Scottish adventure travel company called, not surprisingly, S O E Expeditions, mm. that uh, takes people on uh, treks that retrace the routes of well known sabotage or commando raids. So I found them, and three of us SF veterans joined uh, nine other guys last year in Norway, and we started our trek in the heavy water room 80 years to the minute that the saboteurs lit the fuse there. So we skied across the Hardanger Plateau, stayed in some of the same huts as the saboteurs, and uh, skied to Sweden and crossed the border into neutral Sweden to finish finish our trek uh, last year 
in honor of the service and sacrifice of the heavy water saboteurs. I don't, and so, it, and uh, I mean, this trip is not for the weak or the faint-hearted. I mean, you were skiing. You know? <laughs> yeah, you, wow. you, um, this probably, you probably I want to get in shape for this. <laughs> you know, ski, ski cross-country skiing isn't, it's, uh, it's not like, we weren't doing Olympic biathlon, so it is really just sliding your skis for eight or nine hours a day, maybe pulling a sled or maybe wearing a pack uh, in minus, minus 25. But, you know, we, we got to a hut every night. So every, mm. every evening or every night we got indoors and we built a fire and we melted snow when we had water and then we re- rehydrated our camping meals and we made coffee and we slept in, in bunk rooms that had sleeping bags. You know, we had sleeping bags. So wow. we slept indoors every night except the last night when we slept in the forest outside of the border with Sweden. Uh, but everybody was a experienced winter warrior, a military veteran, or just a mountaineer. So everybody had the skills. This wasn't a trek where we are going to teach you how to do it. Yeah. You kind of had to know how to do it already. And there was a robust packing list and, and you had mm. to have. Yeah, I'm going to have to, I'm going to pass on that one right now, but uh, well, you <laughs> that's know, awesome. Well, you know me, so I can help you. <laughs> I can put you through your pre-mission training if you need to. Yeah, I've, it's been a while since I've wrecked some snowmobiles, but uh, back in my uh, first group days. Well, I tell you, uh, uh, snowmobiles, snowmobiles run out of gas, snowmobiles break, and, <laughs> and there, there is something to be said about oh, yeah. still, having, still having winter warriors trained to survive the cold and conduct operations on skis, because yeah. there may be days when you might be asked to do a mission without a machine involved. Mm. What a fantastic uh, mission. Um, to to really d- take a deep dive in. I mean, you you got a lot of detail for us there, but I mean this uh, this is worthy of a lot of study. It certainly uh, is. Uh, I mean, not in ter- not only in terms of c- the carbon matrix and understanding that that's an excellent example, uh, but also the uh, operational design of this raid, uh, and then of course the uh, the the. the ramifications of the success of it oh yeah i mean this uh this this i mean in terms of uh successful raids and important strategic raids this was this is up there top top 10 or something in history wouldn't you say i would i would say yes and it is uh it's you know it's taught it's uh taught to students that might maybe having to do a version of this in the future uh, there's been a major Hollywood movie made about it in 1965, and then in 2014, Norway produced a five-part miniseries that I that is available on Netflix called the Heavy, oh, no, it's on Prime, the Heavy Water War. Mm. So it's a it's probably a seventy percent accurate uh, modern dramatization of nice. the of the mission and the strategic picture behind it. Told from the German, the Nor- and the Norwegian side, it's it's fantastic. Good. And there's several uh, several great books about uh, out there. If you're wondering, you know, which of the which of the dozen or so books are worth reading, I would probably first recommend *The Winter Fortress* by Neil Bascom, and then uh, yeah, I'd say go with *The Winter Fortress* and. Then Google it, get on Amazon yeah. from there, and just and then, look up heavy water sabotage. I, I'll throw a, sh- a shout out to uh, Osprey. Uh, they're heroes of Telemark. They got a it's a slim volume, mm-hmm. and I like how they make their books. But yeah, this is this is uh, this one you brought over. I've read it also. It's good. Uh, it's not going to go into detail as much as the Winter Fortress, of course. But mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, maybe uh, you know start with uh, the thin the thin volume. Wet your whistle. Get into the deep one. But yeah, I hope that you guys uh, see that it's important to know history. Uh, to it's important to know our heritage, and uh, uh, the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, uh, is uh, the heritage of the Special Forces. That's right. Uh, and then we have, uh, I would say, maybe our older brother, the SOE. However, you want to look at that, our evil twin. Who knows? It's kind of fun. But uh, yeah, there's there's so much to learn. Uh, and we're going to be able to uh, get Mitch over into the G-Base again 
uh, for that one that uh, he teased out about the o- OSS in Norway. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to figure out how we're going to do that one. Well, I tell you, we're putting together, me and SOE Expeditions are putting together a expedition in March of, ni- of uh, 2025 mm. on the 80th anniversary of Operation Lipa. So check out SOE Expeditions' website and uh, start paying attention to their social media because there will be another op on the 80th anniversary of our OSS mission in Norway. Awesome. Hey, great plugs for a lot of this stuff. Hope you guys are doing some reading, and I hope you got a lot of this uh, podcast. I certainly did. I feel a little smarter. I know a little bit more about our heritage, and uh, just what an awesome topic. So, uh, Colonel, I'm glad you're here. Thank you, teammate. Uh, and the Norwegians, the saboteurs, the heroes of Telemark, I'm sure uh, I'm sure they're listening somewhere and they're grateful. These these men, um, these young men helped uh, change the world and helped give us the world that we live in now. Fantastic. Thank you for coming on the podcast, sir. Thanks for having me. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Pinelander podcast. If you enjoy our unique content, please consider supporting our sponsors. Soft News provides special operations news from around the world. It's where Paul and I go to keep abreast of what's going on within the soft community. Check them out at soft.news. American Partisan is the vanguard movement of Western civilization. Be sure to check them out at AmericanPartisan.org. And, of course, Blacksmith Publishing. We've been serving the warrior class since 2013. They have a great titles written for warriors, by warriors. If you're looking for uh, excellent reference material or just want to enjoy a great novel, be sure to check out the bookstore. Or if you enjoy hanging out with warriors, come spend some time with us in the G-Base over at the Pinelander Podcast. All that's at blacksmithpublishing.com. Until our next meeting, stay mentally and tactically smart, physically and spiritually strong, and socially astute. To each other, we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. May God continue to bless Pineland.